Martin Ramirez was born in Los Altos, Jalisco uh, in um, 1895. And by 1925 or so, he migrated from uh, Mexico to Texas and then to California. Mexico as a country was truly finding itself. Um, there was a revolution um, at the turn of the 20th century, and there was still a lot of unrest and very, very little work um, in the 1920s. Uh, Mexico as we know it, um, with muralism, uh, this return to this indigenous idea, this mestizaje as you call it, that wasn't really formed until the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So there were still quite a few decades of this formation of Mexico. In the meantime, you had many men like Martin Ramirez migrate from their hometowns to where there was um, readily available work. Um, and the United States, as it was industrializing, as it was finding riches, gold in California, as it was started mining, as it started um, having slaughterhouses, et cetera, um, had such a, an intense appetite for labor. So Ramirez and three of his friends at the time boarded this train and came to the United States. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting here and can help us perhaps, you know, give us a little bit of insight into Ramirez and, and especially for what happened in the rest of his life is that many of, of these Mexican migrant workers um, intended to return home. They were going to uh, the United States to earn money to send back home and to bring money with them. Ramirez left a wife and children in Mexico, fully intending to perhaps send money back or return with money and just kind of live on his life in Mexico. Um, you know, needless to say, plans don't always go as, as you thought that they would. And many men um, either decided to stay in the United States um, or for one reason or another, didn't quite accomplish their goals. Here we have an image of Ramirez, the drawing, and you, uh, the more you look at his images, the more that you notice that his line um, is so recognizable. Um, the, the movement um, appears in his other drawings, um, not always in tra uh, of trains. Uh, sometimes his drawings are nostalgic scenes of his life uh, in Mexico. Uh, for example, he draws um, the jinete, which is this very traditional kind of uh, man on a horse, you know, very, uh, you know, Jalisco is one of the homes of jinetes, very particular to that part of Mexico. Um, you also have images of uh, Madonna. Um, and the sociologist uh, Victor Espinoza um, has done some research to link those images that Ramirez made with very, very particular Catholic imagery in his hometown. So there's, a, there's some evidence that, you know, these are memories that Ramirez had and was exploring um, while, you know, he was in the United States um, in a hospital. Uh, so, you know, you may be wondering how the, how did Ramirez um, end up being in a hospital for the rest of his life? He did end up dying um, at the DeWitt Hospital um, in, after, let me say, 32 years or so of being um, in the mental health institution. So, uh, as I mentioned, he came to the United States in 1925. Um, and if we can think back to our U.S. history, in 1929, there was a huge economic um, shock in the country. The Great Depression, um, all of that hunger for labor was just something that wasn't there anymore. Uh, Ramirez 
unfortunately became homeless after losing its job. Um, there are accounts that uh, the police found him acting erratically, um, that he, that, you know, no one could quite make sense of what he was saying or what was happening. And, you know, he spoke Spanish. So the language barrier was also something that um, throughout his stay in the hospital continued to be an issue. Um, and then the book that I'm mentioning um, by Victor Espinoza, he goes a little bit into how uh, the fact that he didn't always have a translator um, impacted the level of care um, and the type of care he received uh, while he was um, in these mental health institutions. So now that I've shared some of the circumstances uh, around Ramirez's life uh, and some of the hardships that uh, led him to be um, in a health, mental health institution. Is there anything that comes to mind as you look at the work again? There is uh, this motif that keeps coming up, which is the patterns and the repetition of things. Uh, it's also a way, at least in, in Ramirez's work, um, of perhaps even thinking about uh, moving hills, you know, or a landscape that moves, or topography that changes, is a long piece, uh, 78 inches. So it is, you know, uh, taller than, or as tall as a basketball player, um, and 17 inches, so, you know, um, a couple of feet tall or, or a foot and a half tall. Um, while he was, especially at DeWitt Hospital and he began drawing, he was such a prolific draftsman. Um, and he uh, was also uh, in many ways a very precise draftsman. So one of the, the uh, remembrances from uh, people who knew him at the time uh, is there's this image where he put the drawing on the floor and then he would kind of stand on the table so he could see the composition of the drawing, you know, from a, a different vantage point. So, you know, to me that is this image of like, he was planning out his drawing, right? Like that, you know, this section will be this section and this will be that. As I was doing research on his work is that you know, he made many drawings that were, you know, as large as this one. He would hang up his work, and, and there's this one remembrance of someone saying that uh, he hung it up on a door, and the air would um, hit the paper, and it would just kind of flow, and the paper would just kind of, kind of flow like a curtain, um, which just kind of gives us, like, another life you know, this kind of like living uh, drawing, uh, and a different type of existence um, than the one it definitely has now.